Welcome to another episode of Be Well with MS podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Agnes Trukiana, neurologist, here to explore the fascinating world of multiple sclerosis and the latest advancement in its treatment. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with a distinguished figure in the field of neurology, Professor Stefano Plucchino from Cambridge University. He is renowned for his groundbreaking work in regenerative neuroimmunology and its implications for multiple sclerosis. Today's episode is a deep dive into the complex relationship between MS, aging, and the cutting-edge science that's paving the way for new treatments in multiple sclerosis. We'll explore how Professor Plucchino research is transforming the way we approach multiple sclerosis, especially in the context of neuroregeneration. Before we start, a quick reminder to our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to Be Well With MS podcast. This helps me to produce more episodes that are inspiring and changing people with MS in a positive way, of course. Now, let's welcome Professor Stefano Lucchino. Thanks Good. so much, Magda, for the invitation. Thank you for joining me today. So let's start with your journey, Stefano. Could you share with us your background of your current role at Cambridge University? What do you do day to day? What's your days looking like as a professional? I'm a scientist, uh, much more than anything else. So I spend much, very much of my time um, in the lab with um, with my lab members. And 25% of my time, I have NHS duties, which uh, include uh, weekly outpatient clinics and a fully dedicated research clinic that we have established to um, uh, participate to clinical trials. So it is a very translational um, uh, setup where uh, with my team, we uh, study complex pathobiologies, including the pathobiology of MS. We test and we identify new avenues of intervention. We develop experimental therapeutics and uh, we contribute uh, to uh, translate some of those uh, therapeutics into clinical studies in the research clinic that I said before. So guys, this is super important. So what you are going to get from today's episode is all the behind the scenes, the all the science that happens from the lab uh, perspective to the clinical space where we are prescribing medicine for you to whether to take a tablet or inject uh, or have an infusion in the format of the disease modifying therapies maybe or some other medicine that we are uh, exploring and uh, some of them are under still research uh, within the professor Prusino's lab so so it's fascinating uh, to go backwards one step and sort of see what's 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 on the horizon and moving to our first major topic how does the aging process which is a hot topic uh, i think it's every specialty these days because we started identifying the aging process and impact on general health and brain health in, in particular and how does the aging affect the progression and management of multiple sclerosis that's a, that's a question which I don't think of a final answer yet. Uh, what I can share with you is that aging and impact of aging on physiology and uh, the ability to uh, progress across decades of life and uh, co-survive or resist to pathologies is becoming a very hot topic in medicine. There is uh, lots of enthusiasm around aging and anti-aging research. Uh, which is not always associated with rigorous medical research. There is lots of uh, uh, supplements and lots of claims that uh, uh, patients can uh, can be kind of distracted, coming from media, from coming from Google, coming from uh, lots of you know advertisements. Uh, but w what is becoming more and more established is that aging plays a major role in the way we um, cope with life. Uh, by different means, and not only our day-to-day -day, um, uh, life, but also uh, specifically for patients affected by different diseases, and this is becoming more and more important for neurological conditions, the way our uh, body and the brain is able to resist to the disease, because the disease uh, uh, can be either um, uh, induced or triggered by aging, or in my might be there before we get older, and it, then aging may have a confounding or uh, uh, 
uh, effect on the way on the in, in, intrinsic trajectory of the disease. I I do understand that many of the words I'm using are um, difficult to 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 comprehend in full, but uh, uh, what what we are now realizing with uh, uh, animal research and with human studies is that we need to understand more of the mechanism of aging, uh, ideally at cellular level, in order to um, identify what is the um, interaction between physiological, normal aging and uh, um, a specific uh, trajectories of uh, organ resilience to diseases. Um, we started our conversation today uh, around MS and uh, aging and MS uh, is uh, an incredibly odd topic uh, in, uh, in in medicine. And we are living uh, the unprecedented uh, uh, circumstance where uh, we have the realistic and real ability to connect uh, uh, experimental uh, uh, discoveries in cells, in a dish, with animal uh, studies, with human uh, uh, data. Uh, I'm sure many of the patients who are listening to us today are aware that uh, significant uh, amount of money has been invested by different bodies to promote the generation of what, what, what is now called uh, um, human atlases. These are um, uh, fantastic initiatives uh, aiming uh, at revealing the uh, heterogeneity of cellular responses into human tissues at single cell resolution. And these uh, um, atlases or these data sets uh, allows us uh, making a direct connection between what is purely experimental and what is instead applicable to human beings. And being a clinician and, and a translation scientist, that's my 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 great in interest to be able or to be given the opportunity to connect uh, uh, experiments with uh, real uh, human data in order to infer and to make prediction and to make discoveries which might have an impact uh, uh, on on human well-being. And what these studies are revealing is that uh, a specific aspect of aging, which is called cellular senescence, which is basically the way cells uh, uh, age, uh, is a major aspect, initially completely neglected, of uh, uh, the most progressive cases of MS, uh, something which is in indeed applicable to uh, um, the brain of people with uh, primary and secondary progressive MS, regardless of whether there is disease activity, either clinically evident or radiologically only evident. And therefore, we need to understand uh, what is the mechanism uh, regulating cellular senescence, how senescent cells interact with the rest of the brain, whether they are major driver of specific behaviors, and whether uh, uh, the apparent lack of efficacy or partial efficacy of some of the disease-modifying therapies that we have developed might be due to this confounding effect of an underlying uh, aged brain, which was not initially predicted when those DNTs were developed. Fascinating to hear that. And I think uh, for a majority of our listeners, uh, we not just age and look older over the years, but what happens inside our cells from the very tiny cell structures such as mitochondria, which is our production of the energy to various other organelles inside the cell that ages as well and how that influences our trajectory when somebody lives with MS is, is the purpose of the underlying research and, and the purpose of research to identify what influences us. As far as we learn so far, Stefano, is, is that we, we know that uh, lifestyle, environment, all that, not just disease modify, all that has got an effect on our, how our cells in our body behave. Is, is that right? And, and we noticed that um, from the clinical perspective, as neurologists with special interest in multiple sclerosis and seeing so many MS patients in my life, I noticed that people who are elderly people, the recovery rate, and that is supported by the research, that recovery rate from the relapse is much, much lower. Uh, if you are elderly person, the response to the disease-modifying therapies uh, in elderly population is a bit lower as well. So when we are managing multiple sclerosis, we are always taking into account uh, all the factors, uh, the type of MS, the the age of the patient, 
the function, the MRI scans, the neuroinflammatory markers. And I think our future, Stefano, is that we're probably going to go into looking at the microbiome, proteonomics, and all the other genomics that will be available probably in the near future. What are your thoughts on that, looking sort of a scoping and defining the individual profile using various different aspects of the human being? Yeah, Agne, it's it's uh, it's everything very exciting. Uh, uh, let's try to and and you said all, lots of uh, very 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 right things, but let's try to make it simple and to make it uh, understandable also to lay people. Um, you mentioned lifestyle, which is fine. You mentioned response to disease modifying therapies. You re- you mentioned uh, uh, changes in specific cellular organelles. Uh, and uh, human studies and the way we manage uh, uh, physiological aging and diseases and MRIs. All this is uh, absolutely correct. What is difficult to extrapolate in in, in, in day-to-day life is that some concepts which are absolutely relevant and which, which can be tested very rigorously in uh, experimental settings are very difficult to be controlled in the, what, what I call humans in the wild. Basically, we are all different. We have all different uh, weaknesses. We can have uh, cravings. We can have uh, um, different ways of uh, discipline. Um, so lifestyle is a fantastic concept. Uh, it is obvious to everyone. Everyone knows that smoke is not nice, that uh, alpha diet is not nice, that uh, eating too much or drinking too much doesn't work. But then uh, uh, this is very difficult to apply uh, in uh, uh, large population studies uh, in a very controlled way, or at least in the way we imagine medications and uh, precise treatments. Uh, On the other hand, uh, uh, fantastic uh, preclinical experimental science uh, exists in support of the benefit of those um, uh, concepts that you just mentioned. Applied to the the aging NMS uh, discussion that we started earlier, um, there is already uh, significant, uh, strong, uh, compelling evidence that uh, uh, people with MS is uh, uh, examined by combination of uh, sophisticated MRIs or very deep analysis of um, proteins and metabolites into biological fluids like blood or serum in combination with what's becoming very, very popular and very fancy, which is machine learning and artificial intelligence, which allows supercomputers to use as many data as possible to make predictions, People with MS, much more than uh, individuals with other neurological conditions, at disease onset, what we call clinically isolated syndrome, which is the first clinical episode of MS, not yet fully confirmed, neither clinically nor radiologically, they have already a brain which is average, five years older than a compared individual, same age, same gender, same lifestyle, without MS. That implies that there is something there wrong, either starting from MS itself or starting from something intrinsic into the brain, which makes that brain a little bit older than another brain from another individual without MS. And then if you move from CIS or uh, RIS, which is radiologically isolated syndrome, even in a, even milder as a, presentation, as a clinical presentation to uh, individuals with primary progressive MS, that uh, difference or brain gap becomes 15 years older. So at diagnosis, a human being who is diagnosed with primary progressive MS has a brain which is average 15 years older than another one, same condition, without MS. So that's something important to study. And uh, 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 the macroscopy is the MRI, but the MRI is a picture of the brain. It doesn't tell us uh, what's wrong uh, in that brain specifically, what is the mechanism. It is a fantastic tool that we can apply to observation studies, to clinical trials, uh, which we can use to measure how therapies work on specific aspects of brain anatomy, but it's not a mechanistic way to to uh, to address a question. And then we have to, to go back to uh, micro and nanostructures of the brain, because, you know, we are made of cells. Each of our bodily organs is made of cells. Each cell is made of organelles. And we don't know yet whether that brain aging is brain only, a process which starts from the gut, as you said, uh, the gut and the microbiome are important, or whether it starts from the lungs, or whether it starts from the bone marrow, uh, we don't know yet. 
uh, it is very likely that we will end up one day realizing that even diseases with an organ-specific uh, clinical outcome or manifestation like neurological diseases are diseases of the whole body. And there is also um, uh, dysfunctions in uh, uh, other organs, which we have been neglecting because of the uh, poor sensitivity of our, our clinical outcomes. That's very, very insightful. And what I gather here that, as you mentioned, from the very beginning, there is a possibility that MS, people with MS may have a premature aging process in contrast to the healthy population. And there are so many unknown things that really it becomes difficult to look at the what the potential therapies could be because there are so many unknown things in this world but in a way it's a space for the research and this is where your all the input in the research field and all all the work that you do in the labs is really promising i guess we need time here as all the research takes a lot of time a lot of investment a lot of effort but we'll be there. I, I promise. The future is coming, and uh, we will have more more knowledge. And knowledge is is the currency these days. So we really want to get to the best outcome we can and identify the underlying pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis that we could then address and tackle with the therapies adequately. Now, uh, I'm just thinking a little bit. Uh, moving on to the more sort of. Um, cell topic we're still there we're still talking about the biology but i'm just thinking about the how can we best regenerate the brain okay we got the maybe some sort of premature aging process that may happen in, or may not in multiple sclerosis but what is the overview in general of the regenerative neuroimmunology and what is pivotal role in ms treatment what is all about you know we know that uh, ms by default and definition is demyelinating uh, process in the brain, where the regenerative process, we're sort of uh, looking at the the ways how can we improve the function and and regain the function and improve the communication uh, within the brain uh, structures. So, can you just slightly d inform us um, on regenerative neuroimmunology, which is a a key topic in in general? Yeah, that's my that that should be my bread and butter because that's uh, the the my professorship in Cambridge, and that's my my area of expertise. But I think I have to to make a little bit of clarity on uh, on the premises and on the on the expectations. The semantically, regenerative neuroimmunology is a, a combined wording between uh, a regeneration and a neuroimmunology, where regeneration is uh, making uh, tissues uh, able to uh, regrowth like in um, um, amphibians, uh, neuroimmunology is the study of interaction between the brain uh, and the immune system, which is becoming very, very popular. Now everything in the field in medicine is about interactions between the immune system and something, which is not surprising. Actually, it was very surprising a few years back when I started my journey in, uh, in medicine and science, but now it seems to be very odd and very obvious. And the reason why neuroimmunology is obvious is because we are immune competent individuals. And whenever we as humans have something wrong with our immune system, we develop what's called immunodeficiency or immune dysfunction. And we are at risk of, of dying because of lack of uh, defense against bacteria, pathogens, anything wrong in the environment. So we are immune competent individuals. The old concept was that only cells of the immune system were able to play immune role. They were able to, this is general pathology study at medicine uh, year number, year one, I think. So uh, 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 only cells of the immune system were able to produce inflammatory factors to allow us getting rid of bacteria, uh, uh, pathogens, anything wrong, weapons. Uh, so only lymphocytes. But then uh, being immune competent individuals, uh, research across uh, the last few years has showed something which was already written on paper, but not fully explicit, that what I usually start every of my lectures with is that every cell in our body, since we are immune competent individuals, is an immune cell. Even those which were initially not uh, classified as immune cells, every cell, even cells of the skin, every cell has an intrinsic ability or intrinsic uh, machinery, which is able to make them behaving as immune cells. 
And then a couple of additional concepts which are very important to, to understand the, 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 the impact and the ambition of regenerative immunology. That uh, uh, very often, diseases of the immune system, the most clear example is HIV, are associated with uh, neurological manifestation. And the second concept is that diseases of the brain and the spinal cord are always associated with dysfunctional immune responses, even in conditions like Alzheimer, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson, which were initially thought to be purely degenerative. Even in those conditions, there is something wrong with the bowel, there is something wrong with the gut, there is something wrong with the immune system. Therefore, we need to study how the brain and immune system communicate to each other to understand how to increase the defense of our body, to increase what we call homeostasis, which is physiology in organs, and to increase the ability of regeneration. Then there is a second wording, which is regenerative, which is very, but well, very well applicable to innate uh, organs e intrinsically able to regenerate. One clear example is the skin and the liver or the muscle. But when we go to the brain, the key question is whether we are able to make the brain regenerate. And then uh, we go back to the disconnection between uh, species-specific findings, whereby amphibians are fully able to regenerate, and then rodents are a little bit less able to regenerate, and humans are possibly not able to regenerate. So the challenge in terms of understanding the mechanism still is the same, very ambitious. The challenge and the expectations in terms, in terms of the future, which type of potential uh, treatments will, we, will be, we will ever be able to, to develop, uh, again, still a big question mark whether we have to aim at regenerating the human brain rather than promoting its ability to fix the damage and to heal instead of uh, regenerating the novel. It is a little bit of semantics uh, to discuss, but there is very much on biology of the brain, and we have not yet uh, got there. There is still uh, uh, confusion, both in semantics and in uh, study design or selection of potential medications, uh, but I think we will get there. Just to give you one clear example uh, of a very, very popular clinical trials that Cambridge is part of. This is a very, very famous and popular trial in the UK, at least. I think it's the first uh, MAMS, which is a multi-arm, multi-stage, phase three clinical trial ever run in people with progressive MS under, I would say, completely academic premises because it is fully funded by the UK MS Society. And the name of the trial is Octopus because of uh, the ana anatomy of the octopus, which is very much reminiscent of a multi-arm uh, uh, structure. In this trial, a panel of experts that the UK MS Society has identified, which I was uh, very much uh, pleased to be part of, has identified a number of um, uh, fully approved uh, oral medications which uh, are being repositioned or repurposed towards MS with the ambition and with the expectation to uh, uh, develop a trial which will be making the human brain regenerate. That's the ambition. Uh, we are not sure we will be able to get there. Uh, the, the molecules that we have selected are uh, uh, widely known for other mechanisms of action. They, uh, uh, funny enough, they are targeting those uh, energy production organelles in the cells that you mentioned before, which are mitochondria, uh, there is expectation to be able to um, increase uh, this regenerative capacity of the brain, but there is also expectation that by playing with mitochondria and by modulating mitochondrial function, we can make uh, the brain more resistant to MS, which would be in any case a fantastic achievement. And this trial is at the moment ongoing. It was funded uh, with the amount 17 million pounds by the UK MS Society. We are in active recruitment and we are very excited to be part of it. So we can uh, refer our patients to this trial? Are they, It's a multi-site? Uh, it, it, is a, it is a national multi-center, um, uh, placebo-controlled, double-blind uh, uh, MAMS trial uh, with different centers. Uh, uh, there is a website. Uh, so we'll, patients, share, we'll share this website. Uh, we can share the website we'll share and we can share website. also the UK MS registry website, which is the, <clears throat> the initial thing patients have to do to be uh, considered for the trial. Uh, it is a self-registration, which leads to uh, being part of the UK MS registry. And it is a trial open to people with active and non-active primary and secondary progressive MS with a very wide range of disabilities. Wonderful. And uh, would you reveal what's the active substance being used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is not, uh, it, it is undisclosed. 
So the, the two active substances are um, the very famous anti-diabetic medication metformin. Mm -hmm. And the alpha, the second is alpha lipoic acid, and there is also an additional treatment group receiving the combination of the two. Uh, both metformin and alpha lipoic acid are uh, very uh, much mitochondrial uh, uh, targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is non-specific, so we 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 don't know which cells will be receiving into the mitochondria the active compound. But the the idea and the expectation would be that by modulate, modulating mitochondrial function, we should be able to make the brain more able to. Uh, respond to chronic injury. Mm -hmm. So most of the, the lipoic acid is a vitamin supplement, it's classed as a vitamin supplement, uh, and some studies in diabetes are supporting that uh, it can repair, the, regenerate the nerves and improve the function, how, you know, and we're sort of trialing that in multiple sclerosis now, which is fascinating. And metformin is another diabetes drug, isn't it? It has caused anti, some anti-inflammatory properties and anti-aging properties. And as all the lifespan and longevity studies are referring to metformin, and there are a couple more agents, uh, anti-agents uh, in this life, but uh, not for in this particular trial that's being used. Are you familiar with uh, other medicine for anti-aging uh, at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, but a, a, again, uh, uh, the risk is that we confound the big picture, which is aging, with molecular mechanisms of cellular uh, regulation. You're completely right. Uh, metformin is very famous. Uh, there is lots of uh, uh, enthusiasm in the States specifically to self-medicate uh, with metformin in order to increase lifespan. So it's very controversial also the way metformin is being used. In this particular study, metformin was selected because of its ability in preclinical studies to rejuvenate OPCs. OPCs, for the lay audience that uh, are attending the podcast today, are oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. So are the cells out of which we are expecting new myelin if remyelination becomes a, 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 a target. In these uh, preclinical studies, which were conducted in Cambridge in rats, the metformin, but equally to metformin, uh, something which is equally popular, which is intermittent fasting, in uh, in rats, it was able to um, reset the biological clock of OPCs in old rats back in time, making OPCs younger molecularly and therefore becoming more competent to make new myelin after a demyelinating lesion. So that that's uh, the reason for uh, uh, bringing metformin in the trial. But metformin is a complex one mitochondrial inhibitor which has multiple functions. So the challenge in this specific trial would be to see whether in people with progressive MS, metformin is able to lead to detectable, quantifiable patient reported outcome of impact on disease progression. Oh, on the other end, alpha lipoic acid, as you said, is a vitamin-like compound, which is incredibly brain penetrating. So as much as 96% of alpha lipoic acid that we take by mouth goes in the brain in six hours. So it's all to the brain and it targets mitochondria as well. And it is an energy booster for cells. Uh, and we know very well that uh, uh, both uh, demyelinated as well as, and as well as transected, as well as anatomically intact accents have deficits in bioenergetics. By providing this additional boost of energy via lipoic acid, boosting on mitochondria, we hope to be able to rescue those uh, those uh, accents, which are a major aspect of, uh, of uh, progressive MS. In terms of other uh, molecules, which are all in clinical trials, yes, there is lots of discussion. MitoQ is another uh, a mito booster, which is uh, in clinical trials. There is also um, uncouplers. The, these are uh, small molecules which basically make uh, individual units, working units in mitochondria, working better if there is inflammation. And the targets are always uh, neuronal survival, remyelination, and uh, neuroinflammation, because these are the, major, the three major aspects of progressive MS, which are not yet uh, fully druggable. We don't have medications which are effective in people with progressive MS. And uh, uh, it is very disappointing. We have fantastic DMTs for relapsing remitting MS. They have a huge impact on the number and the severity of relapses, uh, but they are pretty much ineffective in uh, delaying or inhibiting or blocking the transition from relapsing to progressive MS. The only 
and I think this is good for the discussion we're going to have today, the only fully biologic which is available, which was uh, invented by Mother Nature back in early 60s, which has a profound impact on relapses, which is associated with a little bit of uh, adverse events, which is uh, 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 offered only to people with uh, young age and very active drug-resistant disease, is the transplantation of stem cells from the bone marrow, which is a fantastic, it's a real biologic. It's a fully biologic available from other nature. Cells are collected from the, the own bone marrow of patients. They are characterized in the laboratory, they are frozen, and there is a medication which is given to patients to mobilize progenitors from the bone marrow, and they are infused. And this procedure, which is associated with a little bit of adverse events, which are intrinsic to the high level of invasiveness of the procedure, is strikingly able to stop relapses from occurring, to stop new lesions from generating, and to uh, to block very much of the inflammatory phase of the disease. So we, we, have, we have something available, uh, uh, very efficient, even, even more than any other DMTs, but uh, we are not able yet to stop uh, relapsing remitting MS from becoming progressive, and that's why we need these new studies. Okay. So are you referring the stem cells, is, is this a homopathic stem cell transplantation therapy just for sort of a, for the trial that you just mentioned, the last one, or are we talking about... Uh, a different uh, stem cell. No, the the, the 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 example I was providing is the is the hematopoietic uh, uh, or bone marrow stem cells, which is an autologous transplantation, uh -huh. which was established in uh, non MS condition for usually for blood malignancies yeah. uh, back in the days. It was early or mid sixties when the procedure was uh, um, developed into clinical uh, medications. It did take a while to 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 be applied to MS. The first studies are um, mid two thousand, but now it's becoming more and more popular. Even though there is always a little bit of concerns from um, a neurologist, much more than hematologist, for the uh, very minimal adverse events associated with very intense strong immune suppression, which is uh, preparatory to the reinfusion of uh, of the autologous uh, uh, yeah. bone mobilized stem cells. There is another possibility, which is still very early days in clinic, which I think is what you wanted me to discuss, which is non-hematopoietic stem cells, because stem cells uh, is a very, very uh, uh, vague description of uh, immature, variably potent uh, uh, cells we have in different uh, tissues and organs, which we can uh, uh, withdraw or extract uh, uh, which we can uh, uh, um, uh, expand in uh, in the laboratory up to trillions of cells, uh, based, depending on the on the nature, which we can use for cell therapy, and which has been basically my bread and butter, the bread and butter of my team, uh, since I was a PhD student in experimental uh, uh, neuroscience. Uh, my studies in uh, in experimental MS started with uh, uh, a project which was aimed at uh, verifying the therapeutic efficacy of the syngenaic uh, transplantation of uh, brain stem cells, brain-specific stem cells, in an animal model of MS-like disease, which was 2000, so uh, already 24 years ago. Just to give an example of how, how long it does take to start from the initial idea to the rigorous experimentation in, uh, in cells in vitro or in animals in the animal facility into uh, a clinical trial. And I, have to want, uh, and I have to admit that I've been very lucky. So very, very little has gone wrong since day one. So th this is uh, the least likely case study that we can share with, uh, with, with people because always uh, lots of things go wrong when you start from an initial question to the final, uh, the final step. Everything was, was fine. Uh, it was a very smooth but yet very long uh, journey. And we started in 2003 by showing that uh, chronic progressive MS-like disease was uh, very much ameliorated by the injection of brain stem cells, <clears throat> either intravenously or uh, into the lateral ventricles of the brain. Two years after, we also challenged a different uh, MS-like model, still in mice, which was a relapsing remitting model. And we found something, again, we go back to the concept of every cell is an immune cell, that brain stem cells were able to reduce inflammation and to inhibit those infl dead inflammation, which is uh, uh, relevant for clinical relapses. Uh, two years later, we did uh, a, a, a monkey study. So we escalated the size 
of the animal from uh, 20 gram ish small uh, small mice to 200 grams 10 times uh, uh, edier uh, mammalians non-human primates with a very acute uh, almost lethal type of ms like disease and we were able to uh, stop completely these monkeys from dying because of ms like disease and to confirm the very same mechanism of action that we have the previously identified in mice. What's important is that the, 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 the monkey study was done with human cells. So in terms of terminology, it was not a syngenetic transplantation, but it was a xenogenetic transplantation using human cells into immune competent, but immune suppressed monkeys. And that was 2009. And then we did that, other studies. But what I think you wanted to discuss with the, with the audience was uh, is what was uh, published last December in the very prestigious journal Cells Themselves. This is a international, incredibly complicated, highly collaborative, yet uh, preliminary human study. So it did take 25 years to start from the first mouse to the first patient. And in December 2023, we were very, very happy to share with the community the uh, results of these uh, first in men, phase one, uh, uh, proof of concept, dose escalating clinical trial with intracerebral ventricular injection of allogeneic fetal neural stem cells in people with active and non-active secondary progressive MS. Now, before everyone, anyone starts getting excited, this is a phase one study. I've been arguing very uh, strongly with uh, the journalist from the Telegraph who put too much emphasis in the in the article that he wrote the day after the publication of the scientific article because he made too much too much emphasis this is a phase one study there is no placebo control group so we can only uh, uh, share what the study uh, told us and the study told us it is possible to extract cells from a miscarriage human fetus to expand them in the laboratory for several folds of expansion up to trillion cells. So actually one piece of human brain is enough to treat as much as 15 patients as it was in the study. Uh, it is possible to uh, expand uh, these cells in a way that they will provide uh, what we call advanced therapy medicinal product. So it is a, it is a drug. This is a drug that we tested in four different doses in a total of 15 uh, individuals with progressive MS. Uh, and the study also showed that there is no adverse events, not related to the cells, not even related to the procedure that we use to inject the cells. And the procedure was uh, an MRI-guided, uh, stereotactic frame-based, so very, very precise, injection of the cells in a very, very slow way in the left lateral ventricle of the brain. Mm -hmm. Minimal invasive, something which is uh, routine for people with uh, brain cancer when we deliver treatments, uh, which is not fully accepted in the MS field, but which in our case did not lead to any adverse events. So possible, mm -hmm. safe, uh, mm -hmm. safe, and then... Uh, uh, Toxic? No, it was not toxic. So it was very well tolerated. And then we did a number of studies which were not uh, uh, main part of the phase one uh, trial, but which uh, made us very excited, especially in uh, provision of, uh, as we are doing, as we speak, putting together something which uh, everyone would like to see, uh, an efficacy study. And the, the, the logical follow-up of, of a successful phase one study is a phase two study where there would be a placebo control group and there would be uh, people with uh, receiving uh, stem cells. And these uh, uh, additional studies were looking at the MRI, looking at whether uh, lesions, uh, new lesions uh, uh, were formed, uh, whether the brain, uh, which uh, uh, inevitably undergoes brain atrophy and therefore shrinks in volume, over time in people with MS was uh, uh, going towards the very same trend or not. And what we found was two major things. One, which uh, I'm not 100% sure because it might be uh, confounded by the concomitant immune suppression that these patients were on because of the allogeneic nature of the transplantation, which is a, a dose-dependent correlation, direct correlation between the number of cells 
and the reduction of uh, brain volumes. So the more the cells, the least uh, the brain shrinking. But uh, uh, there is knowledge in the field, and I, I'm sure you are aware of what we call pseudoatrophy. Pseudoatrophy is a false or fake atrophy due to concomitant immune suppression or concomitant uh, um, drug treatment. So we have to be very careful when uh, uh, analyzing the, 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 the MRI findings. But something which, or which, which was very exciting was uh, uh, what came out from a completely unsupervised, unbiased analysis of biological fluids. The unique nature of the study that we conducted was that we were able to uh, take as much as seven blood samples in 12 months and as much as five CSF, cerebral spinal fluid samples per patient in one year. So each of these patients participating in the trial underwent five consecutive lumbar puncture during the trial and seven consecutive bloods. And we have processed all these biological fluids by applying something which is very popular now, which is multi-avomic. And multi multi-omic uh, in, in, in the trial meant uh, to be analysis of lipids, analysis of proteins, and mm -hmm. analysis of metabolites. Mm -hmm. And what we found was uh, a CSF only, not serum, response following treatment, which was increasing over time and which was directly correlating with the number of cells injected. Now, we don't know yet whether this response, which uh, led to increase of uh, carnitines and uh, uh, byproducts of fatty acid metabolism, very technical for, for patients, but there is a specific signature in the cerebral spinal fluid only, but not in the serum, increased over time, always increasing, the, more, the, the higher the number of cells injected. So I think this is the foundation for mm -hmm. an efficacy study, which is going to be the next chapter, possibly uh, uh, sharing, to be shared with you in the next few years. Yeah, and it's going to be a game changer to my understanding. It's almost, it sounds to me, broadly speaking, uh, it's like a cellular grafts that are being injected into a human being to repair, replace the damaging or damaged parts that are missing, right, in, in the human being's brain to control the process, if we're talking about the multiple sclerosis of of that sort of a demyelinating process, we want to repair with the extra external cellular grafts. Is is that uh, I, am I interpreting that in the in the in the in the in the way that uh, is comprehensible for, for you having that extensive knowledge? I think it's way more than that. The cellular graft idea is the old-fashioned idea that we have a hole in the brain because of demyelination and we transplant cells and those cells will be going to the hole and making new myelin or making new cells. And uh, it is called cellular graft uh, equal to cell replacement. So basically we replace what is lost. Mm -hmm. A concept which is old in nature, but it is, it is still applicable to some condition. For example, um, orthopedic surgery or rheumatology for a cartilage graft, they very much rely on replacement of what's lost. Mm -hmm. The brain is a very complex organ. It's not as simple as the cartilage. It's not as simple as the bone. It's made of millions, of, trillions of cells, and each of these cells is uh, very, very plastic. So I think that uh, replacement, uh, which biologically is relevant and very interesting to study, is not uh, applicable to the brain. As a matter of fact, uh, what I didn't mention in our conversation today is there very much of uh, the cell therapy, um, uh, I don't know whether it's a saga or a, a TV series or a fiction, started uh, very early in the days. It was 1977. I was uh, six years old, and a guy called Bill Blackmore in Cambridge applied uh, uh, some of the principles that uh, Ramon Cajal and Ortega established back in 1906, which is the fact that if you implant sciatic nerve uh, fragment into the brain, the piece of the peripheral nervous system will be able to regenerate. That's the experiment that Ramon Cajal did in 1906, showing that the brain is hospitable for regeneration. And what Bill Blackmore did in 1977 in Cambridge was to inject in the brain of a mouse with MS-like lesions, so the hole that we were saying, with clear demyelination, 
an extract of uh, cells of the peripheral nerve, the cells that we call Schwann cells. These are cells which are able to make uh, myelin in the peripheral nerve. So did the biopsy, he collected the cells and the cells were injected in the brain. Fantastic work, published in Nature, beautiful new myelin. Mm -hmm. 1977, and it did take, again, 25 years for those findings to be translated into a clinical trial. That clinical trial was done in the States at Hale, 2002, if I remember correctly. Three individuals with MS, one with relapsing MS, one with primary progressive MS, and another one with secondary progressive MS, underwent peripheral nerve biopsy, sciatic nerve biopsy. The cells were collected, were uh, uh, analyzed in the lab, were expanded, and they were injected in a single lesion identified by MRI in the frontal lobe of the brain. And two weeks after the injection, each of these patients underwent a brain biopsy with the idea of showing with a brain biopsy that there was new money. You know what? The trial didn't work. Mm. So the cell replacement idea mm -hmm. is biologically valid, but it is difficult to be applied to the high complexity of the environment in the MS brain because the brain becomes over time not hospitable for the survival, the integration and the differentiation of the cellular graft. Instead, what I think might be a valuable option, and I call it fully biologic DMT, is to use undifferentiated stem cells, which are able to sense the environment, which are able to interact with the environment much more than mature cells, they, because they are stem cells, mm. injecting them through biological routes, minimally invasive biological routes, to allow them entering the brain and uh, migrating specifically where there is signals of attraction and to do their job, the job that they, they do by, you know, by job description, if you like, once they've been created by na Mother Nature, to be regenerative. And that regeneration might take place through different pathways. One can be replacement, of course. The other one can be uh, uh, release of uh, uh, factors which are protective, which increase the survival of the accent, so the survival of the myelin, the reduction of the uh, 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 inflammatory ab ability of astrocytes and glia. And all this has been demonstrated very elegantly in animal models. And I think... Uh, these efficacy studies that we are planning add the responsibility to go beyond uh, the proof of concept, which is now established, and to tell us whether there is any room for advanced therapeutics for MS, rather than uh, we have to rely still on uh, old-fashioned, still very exciting medicinal chemistry and biologics, which uh, are being developed uh, to target specific pathways of the pathobiology. Wonderful. I think such a comprehensive overview and uh, a lot of people when they are just about to get uh, homopathic stem cell transplantation, these are hot topics in MS, uh, in MS field at the moment. So that's sort of the closest uh, therapeutic variant that people envision and imagine that having these stem cell transplants and, and infusions into their body, they almost link that to a reproduction of the myelin in the cell, which is... I'm not quite sure whether we are there and the this research that you described actually proven not to to show that the myelin production so so one trying to say that I think that there are so many complex issues in our bodies and it's not that simple as we we may have imagination about the processes about the therapeutic approaches management and and a lot of science needs to be done in the uh, in the lab to identify and 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 so many other particles and and domains that uh, influences how the cells differentiate how they how they become from infused one cell to another cell and whether the stem sort of a, a very early ma not matured cell being infused in the body how that matures in the body and how it affects the the proteins the signaling and i think uh, maybe we, as a last topic i would like to touch on the basis of acellular therapies about the talking about the extracellular uh, vesicles that are being uh, investigated as a potential role in neuroregenerative process so for the audience to understand the this could be a, a, an example of the, let's say, a, a, a special postal services that uh, if you want to connect one house to another house, 
there is a parcel that uh, and the delivery in that in the package with information that helps to communicate uh, one neighborhood to another neighborhood. That would be sort of a a description of probably a cellular therapy. Could you just um, tell us a little bit about the another way of looking how how can the therapies could be developed in 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 multiple sclerosis field as part of the re- neuroregenerative process, the signaling between the cells, the the structures being used to communicate between cells. Are there any perspectives down here? I'm delighted for uh, that you that you did ask this question because it has been uh, very much of uh, of, uh, of my work in the last ten years, at least since we, we moved to Cambridge from Italy. Uh, uh, and I, I pretty much like uh, the parcel or Amazon uh, uh, concept that you are trying to deliver to lay audience uh, to describe the potential or the role of uh, of um, what we call extracellular vesicles. And the reason why we call them extracellular vesicles is because there is also intracellular vesicles. And there is this ability, because the, the vesicles uh, uh, originate into the cell, and they originate to allow different cellular organelles to communicate to each other and to make, for example, the cytoplasm, which is the part of the cell where very much of uh, the end product are managed with the nucleus, which is the the art disk of the cell, and they communicate to each other and they make everything in place and they make everything coordinated, which is cellular only. But it happens uh, that uh, very many of these cells are also released uh, in the extracellular space, making uh, the communication between different cells. And again, we go back to what we said at the very beginning. We are made of cells and our cells communicate to each other. When they stop communicating, we die. Because organ uh, physiology and survival very much rely not only uh, on the interaction between remote stations, but also on the interaction between individual components of the organ, which are the cells. And individual components of the cells are the cellular organelles. All this is all very well connected. So uh, once once uh, once uh, uh, vesicles are sent out, like mini parcels, uh, they they are uh, potential conveyors of uh, information between cells. This is a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity to speculate on the levels of complexity of how we, we function. It's not just cellular level, but subcellular level. So we go from uh, uh, meters to centimeters to microns to nanometers. Uh, it is very, very low scale, high level of resolution. And there is two fields which are um, exploding. Uh, uh, One is the understanding of the mechanisms and the understanding of uh, what uh, we can measure in biological fluids as biomarkets of uh, organ or individual responses. This is the biomarket field, which uh, uh, for vesicles has opened the um, trajectory of what we call liquid biopsies. They are minimal, minimal invasive biopsies, so it is an anti-biopsy. Instead of being invasive as each biopsy is, it is liquid because we extract out of liquids or fluids eh, the information that vesicles are delivering out of the cells and we infer whether those information are predictive of specific behaviors. Response to treatment, response to disease, response to uh, surgery, response to remission of diseases. Likewise, vesicles can be extracted from uh, media and from fluids, including the media that we use to culture stem cells. And they are fantastic because they are devoid of nuclei, so they don't have any DNA. They are very safe, and they are continuously produced by individual cells under what we call chemically defined conditions. So if we standardize methodologies to um, culture cells or potentially therapeutic cells, we can also extrapolate whether this byproduct, this mini mini Amazon from the cell, have any therapeutic potential, which is what uh, 50% of the field is doing. 50% is doing liquid, liquid biopsies, and 50% is doing vesicle therapeutics. And uh, the the uh, the analogy is also super exciting because vesicle therapeutics is very close to LNP, lipid nanoparticle therapeutics, which is a very smart technology-based, synthetic way of delivering therapeutic cargos. So in in the field of drug delivery, which might be very complicated for patients, uh, we have different options. We have classical, 
tablets or injectables, which is medicinal chemistry. We make, uh, we identify potentially therapeutic payloads by means of medicinal chemistry, applying chemistry principles, and we synthesize them and we develop them. And then there is also other ways to deliver uh, therapeutics, which are by means of drug delivery methodologies, which can be fully synthetic, you know, something we create using biomaterials, degradable or not, uh, uh, using specific um, chemical uh, structures which make them uh, resistant, uh, labile, able to enter the brain or not, to recirculate. Uh, and then we have something which is, again, provided by Mother Nature, which is uh, fully biologic, not synthetic, uh, nanoparticles that cells produce over time and which uh, convey potential information to to target cells. And if we identify therapeutic moiety in cells, which is also present in the vesicles, that's bingo, because we can use the very same principles of cell therapy using something which is much safer, which is uh, much more injectable, much more dosable, and which is devoid of uh, nuclear DNA. I think uh, to simplify everything, we we use this analogy of Amazon and uh, and parcels or packages being delivered by understanding the language of these messages from one household to another as Amazon does the work for us. And what is inside the packages, researchers can use them to deliver specific instructions to the cells in your body to produce some good work uh, to fix the issues like healing damaged tissues or fighting against the diseases such as multiple sclerosis and sending out specialized repair or maintenance crew to specific houses in the neighborhoods that need help you know so so it's, it, we are heading into a, a, a beautiful garden here of of our body that we need to look after like uh, like plants the organs that that we have inside our bodies they are interconnected they are linked immune system is linked to the brain health and brain system and and brain function brain function is linked to the uh, other organs lungs heart and it's the whole unity in our body that we have to look after uh, like a garden plant new plants, stop from harming it, such as stop smoking, doing some more exercise. In the meantime, whilst we're waiting for the brilliant research that uh, Professor Prokino is, is conducting in this world and more and more will be available in the near future, which will be a game changer, which will finally we will have cure in multiple sclerosis and that's ultimate goal and all these researchers in the world uh, are exhausting their own health their own balanced uh, life that they use the hours spending in the labs and spending investigating the process you gather it it takes 25 years and some of the trials proven to be failing to prove the the regenerative process in the brain cells by producing more myelin so so thank you very much, Prop Prokino. It's been an absolute pleasure and incredible enlightening speaking with you. Thank you for sharing your valuable insights and, and for your continued dedicated research to advancing MS and understanding of MS. So to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode uh, of Be Well With MS podcast. We hope uh, you found this discussion as fascinating as I did. Stay tuned for more episodes where we explore the frontiers of MS research and treatment. Until next time, stay informed and be well. Thank you, Prop Lucchino, uh, for sharing your vast range of the knowledge and thanks for coming and talking to me today. Thanks for having me today. Thank you.